What we're doing in our project is looking at the relationship between ecology and evolution somewhat differently from the traditional perspective. What we're interested in is interactions between ecology and evolution. And to illustrate what I mean by this, what I'm showing you here are the results of an experiment. This was an iconic experiment for me, and it was the one that convinced me that the interactions between ecology and evolution were important and of interest. What you're actually looking at is the product of a theoretical model, but this model was paired with an experiment, and the results of the experiment are similar to the model itself. I'm showing you the model because the plots are, are somewhat cleaner and easier to interpret. Now, the upper panel that you're looking at represents a predator-prey oscillation. The dotted line represents the prey, the solid line represents the predator. This is actually an experiment that was done in a model ecosystem in a laboratory, and it was a minimalist ecosystem, which makes it as easy to understand what the interactions were like. In the upper panel, what we have as a predator is a rotifer, rotifer which is a small microcrustacean, and the prey is a single clone of algae. Now, what you're looking at here is a predator-prey oscillation. At the beginning of the experiment, there's a lot of algae and very few rotifers were seeded into the artificial ecosystem. The rotifers multiplied as they ate the algae, and as the rotifers multiplied, the abundance of the algae declined. Now, what often happens in this kind of setting is that predators overeat their resource. The predators caused a decline in the abundance of food, and it got to the point that there wasn't enough food to sustain the predator population. But there's always a time lag between when predators overeat their resources and when the predator population declines, because predators have, have reserves. They don't die right away. They're able to live on and starve gradually, and then only later on do the predators decline. After the predator population declines for a period of time, the prey population can recover, and so the prey population will increase in abundance, and as they increase in abundance, after a certain time lag, the predator population can recover as well. And so what you see over the course of time is this oscillation of prey increasing in abundance, then predators following that increase, and they increase in abundance. But then the predators overeat their resources, and the prey decline, and later the predators decline, and so on. So you've got a regular oscillation up and down. Now this oscillation has been described in precise mathematical detail. And the mathematical description includes the amplitude of the swings. It includes the period of, of the periodicity of the oscillations. And it also predicts the degree to which the oscillations are offset from one another. You'll see that the peak in the prey abundance is somewhat offset from the peak in the predator abundance. Now, the lower panel represents the exact same ecosystem with a single added level of complexity. The lower panel has an ecosystem that has two clones of prey rather than one clone of prey. And this simple degree of added complexity makes it possible for there to be evolution. Evolution is a change in the genetic composition of a population over time. And so when you have two clones of prey, what you can have is a change in the relative abundance of one clone, the percentage of the population that consists of one clone versus the other. That simple added complexity changes everything. The amplitude of the cycles changes, the period of the cycles change, and the degree there to which they're offset from one another also changes. So the entirety of this very simple and predictable predator-prey oscillation is now different. And the reason it's different is because we've added this minimal degree of evolutionary change. What happened is that the two different clones of algae actually have different attributes. One of them's tasty, the rotifers like them, but the tasty clone is also competitively superior to the clone that's resistant to rotifers. And so what happens is that as the rotifer abundance increases, they selectively remove the tasty clone. And what happens then is that the clone, the algae population that's available to the rotifers becomes dominated by the resistant clone. So then the rotifer population tends to decline. As the rotifers become less abundant, the competitive advantage of the tasty clone takes over and the genetic composition of the, of the algae population changes. It now becomes dominated by tasty clones. And when that happens, the rotifers have more food that they like to eat, and the rotifer population begins to recover. But as it recovers, it then causes the algae population to evolve again, because the population now has a declining percentage of tasty algae, but an increasing percentage of algae that are resistant to the rotifers. And so adding this minimalist bit of evolution to the ecosystem completely changes this very simple interaction. 
Now, this brings me to the question of interactions between ecology and evolution. What we've shown here is that the simple ability of having one of the parties in an ecological interaction being able to evolve in the time course of that interaction fundamentally changes what ecological theory would predict. Ecological theory and the study of ecology in general almost invariably assumes that organisms do not evolve. This doesn't mean that ecologists don't think evolution happens. What it means is that we generally think of ecology and evolution as happening on very different time scales. That ecology happens much more quickly to, than evolution does. And because evolution is so slow, it's safe to assume that it's not happening. You can ignore it, at least within the time frame of an ecological interaction. And what this study shows, and what related body of theory shows, is that in fact this may not be true. What we know now is that evolution can be a very rapid process and that the time frame of evolutionary change can be very similar to the time frame of ecological change. And so that raises a question, which is, is it often the case that evolutionary processes and ecological processes interact with one another in a natural system? And that's our goal in this particular project. We want to take a discipline that exists primarily in the laboratory or primarily as theory and to bring it into a natural ecosystem. Now the next question is why should we care? Why should it be important enough to fund a large multi-investigator program like this? And the reason is that if evolution really does commonly interact with ecological processes, then learning how to incorporate evolution into our thinking when we do ecological studies or when we develop ecological theory can turn ecology into a more predictive science.